Hello and welcome to a special edition of Around the Lens. We'll be interviewing a lawyer talking about drone issues on this edition of the show. So if you're interested, stay with us and we'll have a lot of great conversation. Uh, for this interview edition of the show, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Robert Roth. As some of you may know, some New York City photojournalists have gotten into trouble lately with the police for taking photographs of news events using drones. Mr. Roth is here to discuss the legal issues as he is a media lawyer and photojournalist. Robert, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, Dave. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Uh, you're joining us, of course, from New York City. How's everything going over there? Stress that out by for everybody, as you would expect. So many people with a lot to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I know New York City has been one of the hardest hit parts of America with regard to the coronavirus. Of course, we're doing this interview at the beginning of May. And, well, uh, has, has coronavirus gone away? Is, is it still there? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, uh, the daily press conferences say that it's getting a little bit better, but you know, it's still going on and people are still dying, sadly. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Uh, drones are something we talk about quite a bit on the show. Every time there's a new story that comes out talking about you know, someone's uh, drones rights being impeded upon or you know, even a new drone or some sort of new law that comes out. We talk about it because it's something that our audience is very interested in uh, as we, you know, we are visual journalists and we like to tell stories and drones are a very popular way by which to tell stories. They're very, they're, they're almost an indispensable tool in someone's toolkit, much like they have a wide angle lens or they have a zoom lens. They also have a drone nowadays. So having a drone in your kit is kind of something you have to do, and you see it all the time, especially in different awards uh, programs for photography. I would say about a quarter of them nowadays are probably drone shots. You know, it seems, again, it's, it's an indispensable tool, and the imagery is just so prevailing in the world. So obviously one of the places where many would love to fly drones more often is New York City. But of course, the, the laws and whatnot surrounding that capability are, are pretty tenuous. So uh, it's great to have you here to kind of explain what they mean for, you know, perhaps a droner who's in New York City and, and wants to fly their drone, sort of how they sort of manage that if they even can. But before we go into that topic, can you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background kind of you know, again, you have an interesting background. You're a lawyer, you're a photojournalist. So tell us a little bit about that, your history, and kind of how you got to where you are. Oh, sure. Well, without giving my whole resume to bore everybody, uh, went to Brooklyn College undergrad, was the photo editor of the, uh, the Kingsman, the school paper, was also a writer, won the journalism prize when I graduated, went to law school at uh, Mauer at Indiana University. When I got out, my first job was in journalism as a reporter for Billboard, the music business paper. Then I did freelance photography for places like the New York Post, uh, was a photo stringer for UPI, UPI News Pictures at headquarters in New York for years, and then branched that into TV where I worked for Fox News. And since then, it's been a long career working both as a journalist and a lawyer. I was a trustee of the New York Press Photographers Association, and I chaired the Government Relations Committee. Wow. Now, I, 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 you could say I'm both a freelance lawyer and a freelance photographer. That's great. That's great. Uh, do, do the uh, jobs ever intersect, or are they mostly kept separate? Well, I would not want to have to represent myself, but I use the skills that I know in journalism to be able to help, to help out journalists because I understand the issues that they're talking to me about. No, that's great. And you know, I'm curious, do you, uh, obviously you've posted onto the, well, you post on the New York Press Photographers Association, and that's, we'll talk about that post you made soon. Um, do you have any association? Are you uh, partnered with the or uh, a, group, a member of the NPPA, the National Press Photographers Association? No, I'm, I, I'm not a member of the National, although I do know a number of people who 
uh, who are members. It just seems that if you're in New York City, the local organization is where you should be. But, uh, but of course, uh, there are many parts of the country that don't have a local association. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was just curious, what's your thoughts on, you know, of course, NPPA has their uh, their lawyer, Mickey Schreibecker, I, I hope I'm uh, saying that right. Ostreicher. Ostreicher. Ostreicher, yes, thank you. You know, I don't know if you know him or if you've, you've thought about maybe perhaps uh, one day being, uh, so to speak, this, the staff lawyer for the NPPA or if that's something maybe you've thought about. Well, that's, that's, that's already what he does. He is the general counsel. Actually, we know okay. each other very well. We see each other at least once a month for at the New York State Bar Association Media Law Committee, which the president of the bar appointed both of us to be on it. Oh, wow. That's great. So I do know him very well, but of course, um, he's got his viewpoints. I've got mine, just like any other group of lawyers might be. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Great. Well, um, you know, you came to my attention, of course, uh, through some friends. And, you know, I think what Rose, uh, you know, what kind of raised your, your awareness to me was, of course, your uh, post on the New York Press Photographers Association, which, again, I recommend, you know, anyone who has an interest and, you know, is working in the city or, you know, might be working in the city, definitely join that group. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of good discussion going on on the page. Um, but again, you raised, you know, you, you said that recent issues have, have been causing questions about flying drones in New York City, and you went to a seminar for lawyers where they talked about uh, drone operations. Can you talk to us a little bit about that seminar and kind of what you took away from it? Oh, certainly. Um, first of all, people should know that it, uh, legal education doesn't stop when you leave law school. I, the uh, Almost every state bar requires that you take more and more credits in continuing legal education. You In, in the state of New York, like most other states, you need 24 credit hours or 24 credit hours every two years. So I just started my cycle over again. It was after my birthday in April. And I saw this program, Civil and Criminal Perspectives on Drones. It was five lawyers who deal with this every day. And it was a panel moderated by a judge. So I thought, I've got to be there. I've got to go to this. And the night that, it was, as soon as it was over, I thought there's information there I must share with photographers because I like to practice preventative law. My attitude is I want to tell you things so you can avoid getting arrested. So you can make a decision on should I risk this or should I not risk this? And so I went away from there and I, I gave out some information. Yeah, and I think, you know, the biggest thing that, you know, you brought up in, in this is that the courts have ruled that, you know, repeatedly that the First Amendment doesn't provide any sort of privilege to break the law while gathering news. So you can't, you can't just go where you want because, you know, you want to capture news photographs. You know, there's police line for a reason. And I, I worked as a freelance photographer in New York City. I had my press pass issued to me by the New York, you know, police department. So I'm, I was uh, acutely aware of the, you know, not only privileges it afforded me, but of course, the fact that it could be taken away from me at a moment's notice if I ever did anything to raise the ire of the New York City Police Department while on a shoot. Um, but again, like you said here, you can't just go and fly a drone because what you're doing is, you know, newsworthy according to the, you know, the, the, the law here. Um, and uh, per this navigation law that you sent me, you know, you can't, take off or land a drone in the city. So essentially you can't fly a drone in the city. And before we talk about that, can you explain the concept of avigation? Because you know, people know aggravation and they know aviation, but <laughs> well, like, I, I've never heard of avigation before. Can you explain that maybe concept? It's, maybe it's the, uh, it's the aggravated form of navigation. <laughs> I don't okay, know. sure. I think they, they tried to take the word uh, navigation and, and combine it with aerial. And so they, put the two of them together to make it aerial navigation, therefore navigation like that. I think that's how they got it or, got or it. aviation navigation. But what happened is uh, sometime, uh, I guess it was around 1947, the city council passed a law and they wanted to regulate all sorts of flying things over the city, whether known then or which would be created in the future. And, you know, a lot of people wonder wh whether or not uh, things, uh, 
things apply. But of course, they were they were they thought well in advance. Let's see whatever's going to happen. Let's think about it. After all, there were rockets in World War II, which had just ended before then, and they were taking off in different ways. So let's cover anything we can think of. And what the law says is, no matter whether or not you're operating an aerial device legally, you cannot take off or land from anywhere in the entire city of New York unless that place has been approved by the city or the Port Authority. Now there are only, uh, in terms of other than the actual airports, Kennedy, LaGuardia, et cetera, there are only five such locations in the entire city that you can take off or land any kind of an aircraft, including a drone, which is after all an unmanned aerial system. Yeah, and, and this is all kind of spelled out, or at least this portion of the law is spelled out in section 10-126 of the New York Code. For those of us who aren't familiar, can what does that code talk about specifically, well, you know, generally? Sure, well, the, the city of New York has several documents that make up the laws. And New York City, you know, going back to the 17th century, obviously has a lot of laws that have gone back very far. There's the city charter, which is sort of like the constitution of the city. There is the administrative code, which will be analogous to the United States Code, the, the Book of Statutes, and then there are the rules of the city of New York. The rule that the law that you just cited, 10-126, is the law called the Avigation Law. It is still quite well in effect, even though it may be a number of years old, actually sort of about 75 years old or so, but it's still in effect. And this, by the way, is just one of several laws that regulate flying that people have to be aware of if they're journalists. Another one is, of course, the Federal Aviation Regulations, which cover drones, Part 107. Yeah. So, you know, the, again, there's these five places where you can take off and land, you know, but Mostly of course- Mostly parks, by the way. All of them are parks. Right, and, and they may not be where the news is. Like, for instance, <laughs> I believe- not. Uh, you know, most recently, I believe it was what Heart Island that had yes. you know the big news. Yes. It was where they were putting the bodies and whatnot. And right. by the way, that's a common thing they've done for many years, where they've buried bodies on the, the island. From what I've read, yes, uh, Heart Island uh, had its first cemetery, I believe, after the Civil War, yeah. and there have always been burials over there. But uh, at one point, the city decided to adopt it as what was called Potter's Field. Mm -hmm. a place where unclaimed the bodies of people who were, for whatever reason, uh, left on their own, could be buried. Yeah. It's been used yeah. that way for many years. Yeah, so it's nothing like, you know, insidious or something like that. It's, it's standard operating procedure. It's just, obviously, it comes to light when you have a lot more bodies yeah. in New York City. And where well, are they sadly, going? Well, in, in a big city, people die alone all the time. It's very sad, but it's, it's a fact of life. Unfortunately, yeah, uh, that's sad. Um, you know, you, you mentioned in your post here that you know this law has been on the books for a long time. It's an antiquated law, and if if you we want to see change, it's it's something where we might try to change the law and work through the city council. But it seems like it's it's really not going to happen, right? I mean, how how would you get a law changed? And is there any well, success let, let, or pot potential for success to get it changed? Well, of course, uh, Dave, let, let me say one thing. I am not the person who called the statute antiquated. I personally don't like that term. I said I wouldn't call it that because after okay. all, think about this. The Constitution was written in 1789. The Bill sure. of Rights, which includes the First Amendment, was written in 1791. And those are, if anything, those are much, much older by centuries than this law. So I don't really like to call laws antiquated and even if they are it's a, it seems like it's a phrase used by people to say well if i like it it's good if i don't like it it's antiquated and it's out of right. style so sure. so to answer you uh i have been involved for a number of years in trying to get bills that i've written through the city council to restore the parking privileges for photojournalists that were taken away in 2009 uh, by the city then it were for 50 or more years before then uh, journalists, whether photographers or reporters, could park while covering the news. That was taken away. So I've been before the city council myself. And as at first, you, you, know, you have to get a council member who is in favor of your idea and your cause, who writes a bill and has it introduced and has it sponsored and then get co-sponsors. And then there will be a hearing before a committee. And then maybe 
Maybe not, it gets a vote before the council. In the case of the bill that I wrote, it was never brought to a vote because the speaker of the council would never agree to bring it to a vote. Wow. So that's a big problem. Yeah. I, right now, as I said, I, you mentioned in my post, I don't see the mayor or the speaker of the council or not too many council members wanting to do a favor for the press. It just doesn't seem like it. But you never know. They might be willing to do a favor for those people who use drones for business, like construction, engineering, other things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, again, I, I, I'm sorry for misrepresenting what you said. You no, did make okay. mention about, uh, you know, again, the First Amendment is an old rule, but we all follow it. And it's a very, you know, effective rule. So, again, I think, um, uh, you know, I just want to make sure I made that clear. So thank you for clearing that up as well. Um, you, you mentioned here that a test case could be brought. What is a test case exactly? A, a test case is a case where uh, lawyers uh, want to test whether or not a statute is constitutional. So to use uh, an example of one of the most famous test cases, that involving Rosa Parks, who was, of course, a, an African-American lady in the South who, uh, was, who, who lawyers and local people wanted to test the legality and the constitutionality of telling persons of color that they had to sit in the rear of a bus. This was planned in advance. Everyone knew that she would be ordered off the bus. Everyone knew that there would be legal repercussions. Uh, a case was planned and everything took place to, with the results that you know. Yeah. So here, what I'm saying is if, if in fact people wanted to challenge whether or not this law is legal, constitutional, enforceable, whatever it is, you would try and arrange something where you have all the facts in the, all the things that are going to happen would be facts most favorable to your side of the issue. But of course, as I, I mentioned, this is only one part of the equation. The New York City law is one thing that, ha that has nothing to do with the federal aviation regulations and journalists need to be aware of both of them especially as it relates to uh, the pictures that were taken over Hart Island. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, how familiar are you with some of the more popular people on YouTube, like for instance, Casey Neistat? Are you familiar with Casey Neistat? I know who he is, but I haven't looked at a lot of his stuff, uh, probably because he is not at, as part of, my, uh, part of my local group. You know, I, I generally deal with people who are covering spot news and things like that in the streets. So, you know, I've heard a lot about him. I know he has a lot of followers, but uh, yeah. don't know him very much. He, he had a very popular vlog series a few years ago. He was vlogging every day for like a couple of years. And in many of those vlogs, and he was based out of New York City. So many of those vlogs centered around New York City. And he yes. loved to fly his drone all over New York City. It seemed like, you know, he didn't really know about or care about the law and then at one point in the vlog he was like uh so some folks uh you know got in touch with me and uh i you know i'm sorry if i flew flew my drone in new york city or whatever you know um what kind of if i you know if i decide to flaunt the law right and fly my drone in new york city despite these laws what can happen to me you know you mentioned some of the potential what the police can bring up to me but what can like literally happen to me if I get caught flying my drone in New York City right, right now? Well, if we go back, to the Hart Island case has happened within the past two weeks or so. And there were, as far as we can tell now, there were four different photographers who took drone pictures of work crews burying the dead in mass graves uh, on the island in Potter's Field. And of those four, two, we, we could colloquially say got away with it in that the police were not there and didn't see them and had right. published pictures. And of the other two, two got arrested and had their drones taken away. Now, the avigation law that you cited before, a violation of that is a misdemeanor. It's on the books. And to quote one of the top lawyers from the NYPD, uh, our business, meaning their business, is enforcing laws that are on the books. So saying that I'm a journalist, uh, that law doesn't apply to me, that won't work. Yeah. The, the other issue that's really, really important here that I have not seen commented upon for whatever reason is the FAA regulations. When you have a license to fly a drone, you have to obey all the rules in what is called Part 107 of the FAA regulations. 
And those rules lay out where you can fly, where you cannot fly. And one of the things in there very, very clearly in part 107 is you may not fly over people unless they are part of the work that you are doing. So it's section 107.39. Anybody can Google it and look it up, no problem. But I will say this, if you publish a picture or a video that's taken from a drone flying over people digging graves, you may, you may inspire the interest of the FAA to say, uh, you shot this, you violated section 107.39, maybe you should come in here for a hearing. And that I've not seen discussed. That has nothing to do with the New York City law. Now, interestingly enough, you can apply for a waiver of any of the parts of Section 107. It's extremely difficult to get. Uh, the FAA does occasionally grant them. It's called a, a special governmental interest waiver. It's under Section 107.200. I did look at some of the uh, waivers in the database and for example, CNN has a few waivers mm -hmm. for drones. Sure. Uh, Fox News has a few waivers, other organizations. It's tough to get. They require a lot. When you apply for it, they have up to 90 days to make up their minds. Wow. And so obviously this doesn't sit well with some of our colleagues who are of the mentality, ah, oh, this is happening now, I've got to do this now. You know, sure. you, know, you have to plan in advance, you know, just as you plan to have a memory card, good memory cards, batteries, charged batteries, multiple bodies, lenses, et cetera, it's ready to go. You have to plan if you want to do this, plan it in advance, how will you do it? And let me say one other thing, if you would be lucky enough to get such a waiver, it's not simply, uh, if you're called out on an assignment, an editor tells you, I need you to go to the Bronx, there's been a shooting, I want you to take pictures. No, you will need, it's at least a two person job. One is the pilot, the other is, uh, the other is a visual observer, as they call it. That's a, probably a nice term for spotter. You need two-way radio control, two-way radio between the two of them, maybe backup radio, maybe special equipment on the drone, like a parachute. They're fond of requiring a parachute. And you need My to gosh. require, and they, some of these are seven, eight pages long of additional restrictions to have the waiver. So again, it, with, with due, all due respect to people who are publishing pictures, of matters of serious concern. A lot of people are very upset about the mass burial of, of, of the dead. I understand it and I sympathize with their feelings. But again, that's not an excuse for the federal government or the city government. It just, I try and tell people, know what the law is and decide what you want to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, your the sort of takeoff and, and landing, the moment I hear that, the first thing I think of is like, how do I get around that? And of course, New Jersey is right over the river to the other side of New York City. Could an enterprising drone photographer take off from New Jersey, fly over to New York City and come back? Is that legal? I don't know if how much well, there New are, Jersey law, but I'm just curious. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, there are, there are restrictions on, on altitude. You can't be over 400 feet. You must be in a direct line of sight with uh, you know, from the operator, the pilot, the person who's running the remote controls, you must be in a direct line of sight. And of course, uh, there's a distance uh, issue as well. And part of the problem is when you get over the Hudson, I don't have the measurement of the Hudson right now, but I would say, you know, probably at least three quarters of a mile, uh, that drone is getting smaller and smaller and you cannot really see much about it. You see over my left shoulder, the Empire State Building, you can't really tell that it's, a, you know, 1,400 feet high or so. You know, it's yeah. very, very tiny. Uh, so if it were me, I would be like, yeah, yeah, totally. I can totally see it. Uh-huh. Yep. I can see it. Yeah. And let me, let me say the most important issue right now to me, that's safety. You yeah. know, there's a lot of flying over the Hudson, and we've had a number of accidents. Uh, people know about the famous... Uh, U.S. air crash with uh, Captain Sullenberger, you know, mm -hmm. the, the so-called miracle on the Hudson. Uh, the FAA is not rather fond of, of unauthorized aircraft being over the Hudson, right. regardless of who's doing it. Oh, absolutely. 100% totally agree. You know, oh, by the way, but just to be clear, you would, um, forgive me for interrupting you. I'm, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Dave. You would never be able to fly a drone from outside the city to, uh, close enough to Hard Island to get those pictures. Oh, That's just okay, wishful thinking. Okay. There's no line of sight that you could do that. 
Right, right. Even if you had a drone capable of going that far, you it, technically you wouldn't be able to see the drone and technically you'd be... Yeah, it wouldn't be a line of sight. And one of the unfortunate things is uh, in, in this uh, program that I went to with the lawyers last week, as you mentioned, uh, one of the attorneys brought up a, a screenshot and he said, here's what happens when I punch into YouTube drones and New York City and how many thousands of videos there are. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing he did was he punched up an FAA database of near accident reports involving drones. And one of them, frankly, sent chills down my spine. It was a 737 jet was on final approach to LaGuardia. His estimation was it must have been over the Bronx. He was at an altitude of 1,800 feet above ground level, but at an altitude of 1,700 feet, in other words, just 100 feet below him was a drone. And we're having this situation. Obviously, that's scary. Yeah. And things like that are not inspiring governmental officials to, to make exceptions to the rule or widen the exemptions that exist. Yeah, no, I, I'm uh, intimately familiar with aviation and drones and sort of the, the potential that they have for causing not only disruptions, but also damage, death, and, and other things like that, potentially. Uh, when I was living in um, Mississippi, we did sort of a drone education program uh, with uh, folks who flew drones near military bases because obviously there was a military base in, in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi that, you know, uh, and of course around a military base, you can't fly a drone. You can't fly a drone over a military base. And you definitely, you know, within like a five mile radius, you need special permissions to fly in that area. And so, you know, we would educate all the commercial drone and, you know, photo journalist drone, you know, photographers and stuff like that and give them sort of that sort of guidance. And, you know, of course, there's all kinds of um, scary videos, like you said, out there with, you know, drones hitting aircraft or, you know, causing damage to aircraft. So, or flying way too close to aircraft. So yeah, just, just don't, don't test it. Don't go flying near an airport ever. And if you can. Yes. Another, another big danger. Another yeah, big danger, as I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Dave, is what we call foreign object debris right. involving mm -hmm. a jet yeah. engine. A, a drone can fly near a, a jetliner and get sucked into an engine, and that will take out an engine easily, without question. Oh, yeah. And 100%. there have been things, very, very close calls that have happened, because remember, we had a great demonstration here yesterday of the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds and the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. Sure. Those are fighter pilots. They're, they're trained. They know what to do, how to make quick and sudden moves. And they have the jets and the aircraft designed to make quick and sudden moves. Well, first of all, you can't do that with a 737. You can't right. make quick and sudden moves. And you certainly are unlikely to be able to do that with a drone. So you have two aircraft that need to avoid each other, and that is a potential for serious harm. And hopefully it doesn't happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so I own a drone myself. I have the DJI Mavic Pro. Wonderful drone. Love it. Take it with Very me. New. Yeah, take it with me whenever I get a chance. I, I try and fly. I went to Hawaii this past uh, January, and I flew it, you know, whenever I had the chance when, you know, I could legally fly it in an area that I wasn't. I, I always check the, the map. I check the Before You Fly app to make sure, you know, if I'm flying somewhere, I'm not near an airport or a heliport or any place and then, you know, for the most part, when I was flying, it was over the water, pretty much, you know, uh, just kind of getting pictures of the shoreline or the beach or something like that. Um, Robert, do you fly at all? Uh, no, I don't. But let me, before I get back to that, let, let, me, let me say something to you about uh, the Before You Fly app. Okay. It is a great app for everyone, for anyone who doesn't know it. It's, it's made by the FAA. It, you can use it on your phone and it takes advantage of the geolocating capabilities of iPhone or Android. So when you're somewhere, you, you can uh, look in and see if you are allowed to fly from that location or if you are allowed to fly to your destination. Now, interestingly enough, when you try that in New York City, a good portion of the city, maybe at least 75% by my guess, maybe a lot more, is prohibited by the FAA. Yeah. But when you look at those portions of the city, like for example, Southwest Brooklyn, uh, there's a small portion there that are not, that is not prohibited by the FAA. You have to remember, takeoffs and landings are prohibited by the city of New York. 
And unlike a waiver from the FAA regulations, there are no waivers available from the city of New York. There's no provision in the law to grant one. Right. So that's a problem with that. But do you asked me about whether or not um, I flew myself. Uh, actually, no, my experience in covering aviation, which I did, for example, at Fox News Channel, and I was a guest expert on MSNBC and NBC a number of times, and ABC as well, uh, is that I cover the news, I look into the news. Uh, in order for me to be a pilot, I would have to be flying a single engine plane, which was generally not the story. So I did have a tiny little bit of training uh, at one of the major airline uh, flight centers where they took me and allowed me to fly a simulator for a couple of hours. So mm -hmm. I can't say I have multi-engine jet training, but not small plane training, unfortunately. Okay. No, I was just, I was just bringing that up because again, of course, if you're a photojournalist background, you know, I'm sure if, you know, that would be something that might be, you know, within your toolkit. I know when I went to uh, Maryland, speaking of restriction on airspace and uh, difficulty of fly, I was in Maryland and of course, you know, anywhere near DC, it's like huge no fly area, obviously, because it's DC, right? And uh, just trying to find little pockets of area where I could fly a drone was difficult. So I'd have to drive like 10, 15 miles away from where I was at just to find like one little space uh, and of course, I'd research online where are the best places to fly a drone in Maryland or you know, Virginia or wherever I was. You have time. raised an excellent point, Dave, and that is that drones are subject to regulations just like regular aircraft. And there could be a special flight area restriction, as there is in Washington, as you mentioned, areas around the White House. There can be a temporary flight restriction as there is always over the, on the stadium, over the, over the stadium where the Super Bowl is being played right. or, any, or some baseball games. And for example, right now in New York City, there is a special flight restriction over in the area over uh, Ma uh, Fifth Avenue between 56th and 57th Streets, which is Trump Tower. We mm -hmm. can understand all yeah. these, but don't break them. Then right. you're, you may have a visit from federal agents that will not be pleasant. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? Because ultimately, you know, if you shoot some drone footage, even if you get away with it and nobody catches you, you fly it, you catch some cool stuff, you land, you can't do anything with it because as soon as you post it online or publish it somewhere, it's going to be attached to you. And, you know, you're going to get a knock on your door and saying, hey, um, I see you posted some drone footage here. And so I, I don't know why people will break the laws or risk, you know, their livelihood to get some cool drone shot they can't do anything with. Well, again, I, I try and tell people when, they're, when they say they're going to break any given law because they're a journalist, I go, look, you will not be viewed as Rosa Parks. You will not be viewed as Ernesto Miranda, the man whom the Miranda decision is named after. You're going to be viewed as somebody who broke the law deliberately and not necessarily because you are a crusader for the First Amendment. Uh, to quote this, uh, the NYPD lawyer that I mentioned before, he said, you know, we're, there's, this law is regulating where you can take off and land. Think about it. We don't want helicopters landing in the middle of Fifth Avenue. And that's covered by the law too. So you're saying, well, you know, my, my DJI Mavic is just, you know, this, this small, so why can't I do that? Well, you know, there are some answers. You mentioned um, size, right? And I know yep. even with regard to FAA rules, you know, there are some, um, you know, drones underneath a certain weight aren't considered even classified. 55 pounds. Yeah, well, 55 pounds is the rule for commercial drones. You know, then you need a, more, a special certification. Those are the things that you see in the Olympics. Uh, I think in the last, the last Winter Olympics, was it, where there was a, a skiing event and uh, one of those uh, really, really big drones fell right uh, behind a skier. Yeah. You know, those are those things require special training, special certification, et cetera. But the Mavic is a different thing. Yeah, I, I know that uh, DJI just recently came out with a drone that was like under half a pound or whatever the restriction is by FAA. Could someone fly a drone like that in and around New York City? Is, is that a way to get around the rule or is it anything that flies basically? Well, from what I see over here, and I'm just gonna hold up this piece of paper, it says aircraft, is any contrivance now or hereafter invented for navigation or flight in the air. So that sounds like no matter how small it is, it's covered by that. But again, if you feel like you wanna make a test case saying, well, I've got this 
little drone that's this big or this yeah. big and therefore I'm flying it. Again, um, go right ahead. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm one, I don't know that I would want to bet my freedom on it. Remember, right. if you are arrested, it's not just going to be for this law. And that's not going to be the only problem you have. It may well be that the police will charge you with a violation of a bunch of other laws like reckless endangerment or some other criminal statutes. And um, you're going to have some problems with that. You know, so think about it in advance. Yeah, I know with the, the drone that I was referencing from DJI, they specifically made it so that would be 249 grams because that is the limit or that's the sort of lowest possible threshold for um, with regard to FAA rules for, you know, non-commercial drone flights or recreational drone flight, according to, you know, again, what I can see online. So, yeah, I, I'm sure, obviously, like I said, if flying is flying, doesn't matter the size or the shape or that's the it. weight. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just curious about that. Well, you um, know, the... Sorry, Originally, before before airplanes, there were balloons. I mean, there still are. And, you know, the same rules apply to balloons. Mm. Well, there goes my plan to, to do hot air balloon photojournalism. Uh, well, you Island. can always go to New Mexico. You know, they, they, they do it well over there. Indeed. You know, that's a nice place. Um, you know, it almost sounds like with all these regulations, it, it would be easier just to charter a helicopter to get aerial photography, right? Well, sometimes, of course, helicopters are very, very expensive, and helicopters are subject to air traffic control in that the pilot has to be in communication. And as mentioned in one of the, one of the website posts about pictures that were taken uh, of Hard Island within the past two weeks, somebody had gone up in a helicopter and requested to descend below 1,000 feet and was denied permission by the control tower, right. uh, or air traffic control in general, sorry. So you never know. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, again, uh, you know, we talk about changing the law, right? Do you think the law should be changed? Or do you think that, you know, again, with New York City being what it is, that, you know, the law should stay in place? I would like to hear a debate from people who are representing both sides and have researched this and can come up with the intelligent points on each. I can tell you that within the past two years, forgetting all about the terrible situation we're in now with coronavirus, within the past two years, there was one incident in, in Southern Brooklyn in a neighborhood called Borough Park, where there was a funeral of a Hasidic Jewish rabbi. And many, many people went into the streets to accompany the hearse for a few blocks to a, uh, on its way to the cemetery. And so a gentleman who was covering that for a website, covering the story, launched a drone to get a really good high angle shot as we always want to do our editors are always saying give me the high view you know he wanted a shot of the crowd over there looking right over unfortunately for him for whatever reason his drone crashed and it hit someone in the head oh my God. so i assure you that that will be brought up whenever if and when there is ever a hearing about this and that is that there are people who you know again buy things out of the box don't even care what the rule is about getting uh, about getting a uh, certificate to operate it, and don't even care about getting training to operate it. And that's sad because there are so many responsible people who know what they're doing, who have trained and who are careful and who don't break the law. And they're being painted with the same brush about the other people who don't care. That's the sad thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'd say if you are, you know, having a drone and you plan to fly it, you know, register it, you have to register it. Um, well, I, I don't know if you have to register if it's below 0.55 pounds or 250 grams, but I know like, for instance, I had to register my Mavic Air. So I went on the website, I have to write the serial number or whatever in, on the drone. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like the bare minimum of things that we can do. And, you know, that's kind of another topic. And, you know, I don't know if you want to get into it too much, but with regard to liability, you know, when flying a drone, like, for instance, if my drone hits someone, obviously I'm liable for that, right? Well, clearly you need insurance. You know, there are many things. Yeah. Again, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, in photojournalism don't necessarily think about being insured for the liability that they might incur uh, in the course of doing their jobs. And that is an issue that really needs to be explored further. Um, again, I, I haven't seen that enough from 
uh, different organizations. It's, it's an important thing. You, you don't want to wind up because you shot a picture and something bad happened that you're now going to be sued for a large amount of money. Yeah, I mean, with all the rules, regulations, and everything else, it's 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 almost like it's almost not worth it to have to fly drones. You know, it's like you practically need like a pilot. I know in Canada, and you may I don't know if you can you know the Can Canadian law, but I don't know myself really. I'm just from what I've seen of other people doing videos about it. But it seems like they're very restrictive on even like non-commercial recreational flight of drones. Like you have to have a practically an aviation license to fly a drone. Well, while I don't know Canadian law, I can tell you that there are, uh, there are countries with much more severe restrictions than the United States on many parts of aviation. For example, in Europe, they do not allow what is called night VFR, night flying under visual flight rules alone, whereas in the United States, that is allowed. So, the, you know, okay. there are different governments, different legal systems, different schemes of regulating aviation. Yeah, I know, I know on the show that we've discussed a few instances of sort of where, you know, traveling with the drone internationally has gotten people in big trouble. Like, I, I don't know, it may have been Cuba or another country, but someone was flying a drone in another country and they were essentially like arrested and held in jail for, I think, two weeks or something because of that act. Um, so, yeah, definitely check your legal local laws wherever you're traveling, you know, with your drone. The world is a lot more complicated now, and a lot of people don't like to hear uh, when they say they're going on an assignment to place X, uh, check with a lawyer. I mean, they just, they, they don't, they feel it's interfering with, you know, their job, with their creativity, whatever, but it's, it's just, it's, it's important. And like I say, I practice preventative law. Ideally, you talk to me, if you, if you hear what I have to say, you won't need a criminal defense attorney. Right. But one thing I'd, I'd love to bring up with you, Dave, that we haven't yes, covered, please. and that is a collateral consequence of flying a drone in New York City if the police come after you. And that is, as it stands now, you mentioned you had a press card when you were in the city. Yep. There are cases where the police decide on an interaction with a journalist that they are going to take away the card. Right. And if they take away your card, you have just bought yourself a lot of trouble because you're going to be called for a hearing and i think that there are maybe six of uh, uh, six of us in the media law community or maybe 10 let's say who actually have any idea what's going to go on in that hearing and what can be done to get you your card back and it's uh it's just uh it's a pain that nobody nobody should get nobody should, nobody needs there you can't avoid interactions with the police but you can decide what you're going to do on any given day and how you're going to cover what story or not cover it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've been threatened, you know, again, with taking away my press pass when I was doing a shoot. And uh, yeah, I, I don't want to, I didn't want to ever have that happen because again, it, it impacts my ability to do my job. And it, it, you know, of course that's going to impact, you know, my employment potentially with a, you know, a, a company or whatnot saying, well, if you can't shoot in the city, you know, or you can't shoot in things, you know, you should have gotten your press pass taken away. So it's definitely a threat. And in fact, our, one of a you know, friend of our show, you know, co-host Zach Roberts has brought up, you know, the sort of, how do I say, uh, posing viewpoints or posing issues where you have the press pass being issued by the NYPD, you know, that sort of conflict of interest, if you will. But, you know, what well, that's do, been around right? for that's been around for many, many years. Uh, yeah. In uh, 2000, 2009, PD had hearings to revise the press card rules. They said very clearly that they don't want to be in the press card business, but they've never suggested a way for anybody else to do it. You know, no, yeah. But they at least have clearer rules now than there were in the past on who gets the card. Right. When I worked for UPI, there were a certain point in time where the managing editor wrote a letter saying the following people are accredited, the following staff and stringers are accredited, please issue them the cards. Things are a lot different now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I know when I got my press card and gosh, like 07, 08 time frame, you know, I needed a letter from my editor. I needed a couple of screenshots of pictures or you know, printouts of pictures that have been published and stuff like that. But it wasn't, you know, you fill out some paper, it wasn't that extensive. So it's more difficult now? Well, it, it was around the, I would estimate, uh, it was around the late 1970s where they changed uh, the rules 
so that uh, they required uh, you, they required whoever applied for a card to list three assignments that he or she had mm -hmm. done where the yep. card was needed. And sometimes that was honored very loosely when it came to people who were either staff or, or stringers for major news organizations. And then when the rules were revised uh, in response to a lawsuit filed against the city, then they insisted on clippings or uh, CD-ROMs or USBs or other things showing proof of the work done. And in many cases, if they want URLs, if it was published on the web, yeah. they want to know that this is for real. You actually did this and it must, it must be of a certain type of, of uh, assignment. So whether or not you might've needed a picture, you might've needed a press card or you think you needed a press card. It has to be where they think you needed the press card. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and but again, this is they can take it away if they want to. So it's like, you know, is well, we could do a whole program. Speech? Who knows? Yeah, maybe we will one day. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you so much, Robert, for taking time out to be on our show today. Okay. As you mentioned, you know, preventive uh, legal advice is very important. And, you know, thank you for offering your legal advice on. I know you were answering questions on the Facebook page. Um, but again, you know, what would you like to tell people out how they can you know, find out more about you and your work and, and uh, what you Well, um, you can, of course, find me on in the NYPPA social events group or the, if you're a member of the NYPPA in the regular group. And uh, I've had some website trouble, but my regular website with basic information is Roth, R-O-T-H dot N-Y-C, or feel free to look me up in the Martindale Hubble Lawyers Directory, the preeminent lawyers directory where I am rated preeminent and very ethical. And by the way, never select a lawyer who isn't rated very ethical. Ah, exactly. Um, and, and did you, I think you mentioned you want to push out your email address as well? Was that something it, you wanted to have? It can, be, it can be found on the website if okay, people want to contact great. me. Thank you. Well, awesome. Well, yeah, definitely go out there and then you know, check with Robert. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer your questions to the best of his ability. And you know, again, Robert, thank you so much for taking time out to discuss this issue. Obviously, it's very important and you know, your opinion and also the facts and, and knowledge and you know the the work not leg work actual work you've done to, to research the issue is very important so we appreciate that thank you for having me dave i hope we can answer some questions again in the future absolutely i'm i'm, I'm sure we will because the drone issue isn't going away uh unless you know they ban all sales of drones in the united states or something like that so i think drones are going to be around for a long time well, journalists uh, will not stop covering the news and there will always be issues between the government and the press. Definitely. And um, you know, we'd love to talk to you more about uh, other issues related to that in the future. Sure. So happy to have you back. Uh, for Thank that. you very much. Thank you again. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching or listening to this episode of Around the Lens, our special interview with Robert Roth. Uh, if you are interested in more content like this, go to our website, aroundthelens.com, where you'll find links to all of our social media. In addition, if you'd like to support the show financially, you can go to patreon.com slash aroundthelens, uh, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get everything that we do uh, ahead of time, uh, sometimes a week early. So uh, by all means, go ahead and check that out. And you know, of course, like, comment, subscribe. And if you've thought or had any opinions or had any questions about anything that we discussed, please leave them in the comments down below. Again, Robert, thank you for your time. And to everyone else, I'm David J. Murphy. This has been Around the Lens, special episode interview edition.